Greetings from the world headquarters of the United Pentecostal Church International in St. Louis, Missouri, USA. I'm the General Superintendent, David Bernard, and I'm happy to have with me in the studio, Pastor Dave Henry of Atlanta, Georgia. Now, Brother Henry is the presbyter of the area, which means he was elected by the pastors in the Eastern Atlanta area to be their representative, and he sits on the Georgia District Board. He is also the director of Building the Bridge Ministries, which is an important ministry of the UPCI. It's focused on evangelizing the African-American and black communities. Uh, let me hasten to add that we work very closely together. Uh, Spanish evangelism, multicultural ministries, Building the Bridge Ministries. Our goal is to have one church composed of every nationality, every race, every language, all working together as one body. But to do that in our world, we understand that we must give particular focus and attention to make sure everyone is represented, every voice is heard, and the, we work together closely. So in that regard, in virtue of being the director of Building the Bridge Ministries, uh, Pastor Henry also sits on the general board of the United Pentecostal Church International, which is our highest governing body short of the general conference itself. Now, what we're doing today, we want to have a candid conversation about race. Obviously, in our world today, in our culture, in our society, this is a very important topic. Amen. And uh, some people say, well, uh, let's just ignore it because we all love one another. We're all Christians. Right. And in an ideal world, that's what we would that's do. Right. But in the real world in which we live, people have questions. They have maybe perceptions and in some cases, maybe wrong perceptions. Right. But how do you address them? Well, I think talking about them. Uh, and of course, we have to be honest that there are issues and problems, uh, even within the church. The temperature on the outside affects the temperature on the inside. Right. So what's going on in the culture does affect the church. So to the extent the church falls short of its ideal, we've got to be honest. We've got to talk about it. Right. To the extent the church fulfills the ideal, well, we celebrate and we encourage one another and we try to do better. So uh, we've had some great conversations over the past year or so, yes, and I'm sure we'll have more again uh, with many of our ministers of all races, uh, but particularly here in the U.S. and Canada, which is our home base, that's what we're focused on. And so I've asked Brother Henry to come with some questions uh, that he's designed or that different ministers have suggested to him. Uh, the questions aren't from me, uh, but we've had these conversations before, so I, I know uh, to a great extent what we're going to talk about. But uh, Brother Henry, I'd like for you just to say whatever else you want to say by way of introduction, and uh, let's get started. Yes, sir. Thank you. Again, thank you, Bishop, for um, facilitating this and your willingness to have this conversation. I think that um, for many in the um, African-American community, you have developed a, a tremendous trust. And, um, and I think not only in that community we're dealing with that issue, but in many communities, because you're not afraid to tackle the issues. You're, you're not afraid to have the conversation, no matter how hard they may be. And I think that gives you credibility. And it, it gives you respect too, because when, when a person are willing to deal with hard issues, no matter how difficult they are, um, it puts you in a different um, spirit. It puts you, people think and view you different because most people, you know, they become political, so they're going to protect their political in um, interests. Now, for you, at least from what most of us have, have observed, that is not an issue for you. You, you, you really want to make a difference um, in the kingdom um, of God. So thank you for um, having this. I mean, like for me, being from Jamaica, came here in the early 80s, mid um, 80s. And, you know, I, 1990, I married a young lady from Mississippi. And, you know, I came from a different perspective, a different point of view. But being married to an American from Mississippi and then so many friends, I was able to really understand the, the, the difference in the African American experience. Yes. And so it really informs me well. And so I'm glad to be a part of Building the Bridge Ministries. Back in 86, I became a part. And it's been a good track, a good uh, ministry to be a part of. 
But again, thank you for your willingness to have, for us to sit and have this conversation. And thank you for what you do. I've observed you on our general board and you are very, um, you're very effective as a leader. And I want you to know that I personally appreciate you. We appreciate you. Um, I've talked to people who are part of other oneness organization who have given you eye marks. And um, I've, I've was told this, I didn't hear it directly, but even some in those um, other fellowships say that you're the first superintendent that they trust um, at a level, because again, one, your candor, your honesty, um, your experiences, you know, um, you are, you're very well culture. And I think that gives you the head. So thank you again for um, having this conversation. Now, the last time we had a conversation was on a conference call. It was very fruitful, um, we thought. And um, some, some of these questions were asked and um, we thought, you know, that we could do this and ask you some, some of these same questions. I did not um, um, ask these questions directly. These questions were formed from the people in our um, ministry. And the first question I'd like to ask you, Doctor, um, is this, what measures are in place to address issues of racism among the licensed uh, ministers in the United Pentecostal Church? So let's talk specifically about the United Pentecostal Church International. And I do want to say, you know, we're all shaped by our experience. Yes, sir. And I appreciate you sharing yours. Um, I grew up in Korea. Yes, sir. And uh, so I was in a different culture. And while I was blessed and favored as an American citizen, yet, um, I learned what it was to be different from everyone around me in my community. Yes, sir. Um, and my parents were pioneer missionaries of the UPCI. They started churches among uh, American soldiers. And so those services were completely interracial uh, from the very beginning, 1965, right. as well as churches in the Korean community. And so all my life, I've been in a multicultural, multiracial environment. Yes. When my wife and I started the church in Austin, Texas, uh, we built a truly multicultural, multiracial church um, to about a thousand constituents. About 50% were Caucasian or white and 50% were all other ethnicities, uh, primarily Hispanic, African-American, uh, with some Native American and, and Asian as well. And so I mentioned that because our experiences do shape us. And your question, what are we doing uh, with regard to United Pentecostal ministers. Yes, so not everybody has that same experience, right. but we can, through training, try to give them perspectives. Right. And so we have a training program. Everyone who wants ministerial credentials with UPCI must go through a series of reading and a series of videos. Yes, and so what I've done for the in, on the introductory level Everyone has to read the UPCI manual, and right. it contains our position papers, and we have a very strong position paper called Racial and Ethnic Affirmation, where we say that racism is a sin and that the goal of the church is to be deliberately inclusive, intentionally right. inclusive. Um, and so as part of that, I do the training on that in video form, and I cover the kind of things that we're talking about today. So right. that means... Every uh, minister who receives credentials with UPCI right. mm -hmm. will at least get some basic introductory training yes, in both written and video form. Right. So that's a start. Yes, sir. Uh, we also encourage every local church, every district to be intentional in these areas. And I'm happy to tell you we're right now developing a new curriculum called Mosaic, which is a multicultural evangelism and di diversity curriculum consisting of both text and video. And it will walk us through how to be a truly multiracial, multicultural church yes. on the local level, the district level, the national level, the international level. And it, it gives uh, ideas and guidelines for how, first with a biblical foundation, a historical foundation, which right. covers the good and the not so good. Yes. But it focuses on the true vision of the Pentecostal movement from the beginning. Right. And the oneness movement particularly, even more than the rest of the Pentecostal movement. Mm -hmm. It was founded on an idea, if we believe in the oneness of God, we need to believe in the oneness of God's people. Mm -hmm. And it was founded with an interracial vision that has sometimes been neglected or lost. Yes. But it's our job to go back to our biblical roots and right. our own historical roots. Mm -hmm and recapture yes, and fulfill that vision. So the Mosaic curriculum 
is going to do that. And it gives particular attention to special issues of the African-American history, which has a unique and long history in the U.S. that right. needs to be understood yes, if you're going to be effective mm -hmm. in, in discipling African-Americans or even being effective in society. You have to know right. that history and that perspective. But it also is going to talk about uh, the Hispanic experience and other ethnicities yes. and language groups. Um, and so I think it's going to be an exciting uh, addition to, yes. to our overall training. So that's uh, that's at least a partial answer to your question, but I'm sure we'll yes. cover more sure. as we, we go through our discussion. Let me ask you, in light of that, I, as I have traveled and um, talked with people, some, not all, have this misconception, uh, maybe I would say, or some have a, a view that the United Pentecostal Church um, is uh, at least subscribe some within the United Pentecostal Church subscribe to a racist mindset or view. Um, is there a way that you could speak to that to kind of give um, sure um, some? Voice? Well, for, certainly, I would say we are absolutely against racism yes. and always have been. Um, our our position paper, which is on our website, yes. you can go to upci.org. Right. Go to I think it's under resources statement uh, archives, and we have what's called the racial and ethnic affirmation as a position paper. Yes, sir. Uh, and then we also have, I've written uh, kind of a report, uh, which is, is uh, a racial and ethnic affirmation uh, discussion mm -hmm. with some of the same points we're talking right. about today. Right. And then I also have a timeline which says, what have we done intentionally and deliberately right. uh, beginning in about the, the early 70s? Mm -hmm. So for, for the last 50 years, yes, what steps have we taken? Now, uh, so I want to first of all say we stand clearly and forthrightly against racism right. in all its forms. Right. Now, we are a historically majority white organization. Uh, we have had uh, minorities from the very beginning. We were yes, formed in 1945 as right. a merger of two organizations. Yes, On our very first list of ministers, we have African Americans, mm -hmm. we have Hispanics, uh, we have Asian Americans, uh, we have people even from other countries, right. from Jamaica and other places. Uh, so we've, uh, however, uh, reflecting uh, U.S. and Canadian society in 1945, yes. of course, we were heavily white. Right. Um, and there is a long history, which maybe I should talk about a little bit more, but I will say we have tried to become intentionally more inclusive and more diverse uh, as our country has changed right. and as our awareness has grown. And as I mentioned earlier, the early oneness movement started with a clear interracial vision, which was obscured. Right. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the Jim Crow laws in the South that were very harsh in the teens, 20s, 30s that made it difficult for, yes, for us to have conferences mm -hmm. because blacks and whites could not uh, meet in the same location, could not uh, meet in the same hotels or right. eat in the same restaurants. Right. And uh, so what we had at Azusa Street, which was one of the big uh, formation revivals of the Pentecostal movement, we have this famous statement by Frank Barlman, who was a oneness yes. preacher, he said the color line was washed away in the blood, how there was a true interracial right. unity. Right. And so the early oneness people all worked together in 1918 uh, in one organization of black and white. In 1924, most of the white ministers left and formed three regional organizations. So they said it was because they couldn't have conferences together. I think, to be honest, there was some internal racism, but I do believe as I read the records, most of it was external in the sense the pressures of society. Right. They couldn't hold interracial meetings. They couldn't have interracial churches. They would be attacked in their community. Right. Right. Uh, and the reason why I think that is to a great extent true is when the white ministers left, and not all of them left, but right. the majority, they formed three regional organizations so they could have regional conferences. Yes. And then what is more significant, and it never happened in the Trinitarian Pentecostal movement or with the Baptists, the Methodists, or anybody else, in 1931, the two largest organ oneness organizations, one predominantly white, one predominantly black, 
merged again mm. because they felt like we need to try to make this work. Right. Mm. And I don't know of any other religious organization in 1931 mm. that was intentionally right. Uh, trying to merge back again. They yes. merged the two names of their organizations to form the Pentecostal Assemblies of Jesus Christ, which is one of the predecessor organizations of the UPCI. Right. Their initial board, they decided, even though the composition uh, composition of ministers was probably something like 75% white, 25% black, they their initial board was 50% white, 50% black, because they're trying to be very right. intentional. Unfortunately, the same pressures, the same difficulties of conferences. And so by 1938, most of the black ministers had left. I still feel the majority of the responsibility has to rest upon the majority, right. the white majority. Yes. But my point is, from 1918 to 24, and then again from 1931 to 38, the oneness ministers were trying their best in a segregated society mm -hmm. where half the country right. was laboring under strict Jim Crow laws, mm -hmm. They were trying to overcome that and be countercultural. They didn't fully succeed, which is tragic. However, one of that organization that tried was one of the organizations that became the UPCI. And there were still some black ministers uh, who stayed in that fellowship and became part of the merger in 1945. But for me, the tragedy is, if you think historically, the civil rights movement really got going in the 50s. Mm -hmm. If somehow we could have tried to hold together and be counterculture for 20 more years, right, right, right. we would have been at the forefront mm -hmm. of, of racial reconciliation of the civil rights movement. Yes. Now, we can't go back and, and uh, redo that, but we can be intentional where right. we are. So I, that was kind of a long way around to say, no, the oneness movement was not founded as a racist movement. It was founded as an integrated movement. Right. And it kept that vision all along mm -hmm but faltered somewhat. Right, right. So I look at it as a oneness minister. I don't have to go back and say my foundation was bad. Mm -hmm. I need to go back and say my biblical foundation in the book of Acts was good. Right. My foundation in the early 20th century American context was good. Right. To the extent that we failed, mm -hmm. we can go back to the Bible and we can go back to our own oneness right. heritage, yes. which was a good foundation, right. not a flawed foundation. Right. And we need to restore that yes. vision. So uh, now, now let's put it today where we are today. Of course, the UPCI is a worldwide organization. Right. In 198 out of 210 independent nations, uh, plus 34 territories. So we're in almost every nation of the world, uh, over 5 million, something like 5.2 million constituents. Uh, and so the vast majority of UPCI constituents are not white. Yes. So if you say, what is the typical uh, uh, you know, UPCI constituent? Well, from a worldwide perspective, we're going to be more represented in Latin America, Africa, right. Asia, than even here in right. North America. Right. Uh, so to me, that's important. And it's also important to know we have what's called a global council. The global council uh, governs the international activities all over the world. And our goal is to establish national churches in each country which are self-governing. And so they will have representatives from uh, to the Global Council. So uh, today, uh, we probably have uh, something like uh, 60 members, 55, 60 members of the Global Council who are not white, but right. would represent other nationalities. And included that would be something like 35 or 40 uh, blacks, African Amer or Africans, Caribbeans, different ones. Mm -hmm. So really on an international level, we have a very strong uh, interracial top leadership representation. Now in our home base, which is the U.S. and Canada, um, we still reflect the majority of the population, which is, which is white historically. But my goal, which I've stated many times, is our church needs to reflect the diversity of our nation. Mm -hmm. And as we do that, then our leadership, our ministry, needs to reflect the diversity that is in the church. Mm -hmm. And then our top leadership needs to reflect the diversity that's in right. our ministry. Right. So it's a work in progress. Right now, my best estimate, we, we don't, since we're, we're congregational, have self-governing churches, we, we don't try to control local churches. And uh, so we don't necessarily have statistics about the internal workings of each church. 
But my best estimate is about 30% of our constituents in the U.S. and Canada are non-white, mm -hmm. Hispanic, African-American, and, and others. Uh, among our credential ministers, about 15% would be either what, the, what I just mentioned, uh, Hispanic, Afro-American, Black, uh, some Native Americans, Asians, and others. Uh, so, uh, and increasingly, I think six members of our general board would fall into that category. Uh, many districts now would have uh, minority representation on the district board by the electoral process. Mm -hmm. uh, overall, district leaders, of course, that changes every year uh, through elections and right. appointments and so on. But we now probably have, uh, from the, the last survey I did, uh, we've got between 250, 300 leaders of various districts. Uh, by that, I mean on the district board or uh, uh, committee chairman or department heads that would be, again, in these categories of um, Hispanic, African-American, yes. uh, or Asian-American, so on. So uh, a lot of progress has been made. Just in the last 10 right. years, there's been... Pro, I think it was a 58% increase yes. in minority representation. Uh, we still need to make more progress. Right. Uh, but our headquarters executives, our headquarters employees, our Urshan College, Urshan Graduate School, employees and uh, administration, staff, students, all of those are now reflecting more and more the diversity yes. uh, of our church. So I think we can say uh, very positively, uh, no, uh, we're still majority white in the U.S., right. not so in the rest of the world, but we're starting to really reflect um, the diversity of our society in our constituents and now in our employees, executives, and leadership as well. Uh, thank you for answering that. Now, are, are you aware um, that there's a perception out there, and um, accurately or not, is still an, uh, uh, a perception that there is some racist um, tendencies or some even describe people within the United Methodist yes. Church as racist. How, how would you help to kind of sh um, debunk that? that um, sure. That, that uh, well, let's, let's be honest, let's be candid. Um, when you have over 5 million constituents, mm -hmm. and even in the U.S. and Canada, which is more the direct responsibility, yes. we're getting close to, I think we have around 4,900 churches, daughter works, preaching right. points. When you're dealing with almost 5,000 congregations, for me to say, I know for a fact among 5 million constituents right. worldwide and among 5,000 churches in America, you will never find a right. racist. I could say that. Yes. And I've talked to people who said, I've gone to a church and I felt like I was treated mm -hmm. wrong because of race. And so uh, what I will say, we believe that's a sin. Mm -hmm. So I can't guarantee you'll never... That will never happen, right. but you, I can say we will take a stand against it. What I did as a pastor, even I told people, as, a, as I said, half of our church was white and half was everything else, and I would make the statement from the pulpit. I want everyone who lives in the Austin metropolitan area to feel like they could come to our church and can belong. Mm -hmm. They could be in the choir. They could be a minister. They could be on the church board. Mm -hmm. They would feel welcome. Uh, but I w went on to say, I can't guarantee that you'll never face a problem, even in our local congregation, because I can't control people. Right. But I do guarantee this. If you have a problem, you come talk to me and we'll try to work it out. If somebody has treated you wrong, we'll deal with that. Right. If somebody is a racist, I will deal with them. Uh, or if it's a misunderstanding, I will mediate, negotiate. Mm -hmm. We want you to you bring the problems to our attention. So my answer is... As an organization, no, we're not racist. We we very positively affirm biblical values. I do not personally know of any preacher that I could say they are racist by their deeds and actions, you know, speech. Um, if I knew somebody like that, they would be subject to ministerial discipline. I would probably contact their district superintendent and say, you need to talk to this person and they either need to recant or you need to bring them up before the district board. Mm -hmm. Um, and because I, I would work through the scripture. I right. wouldn't just try to attack a person. Yes. But sometimes I have dealt with people that I felt were insensitive or wrong. If I had an opening to talk to them, I've talked to some of those directly. So some I've talked to their district superintendent and say, you need to follow up on this person. What they're saying on social media to me 
sounds wrong, mm-hmm. sounds like racist, mm-hmm. or or could be misunderstood or, or misinterpreted. Right. If they don't really mean it, it could be seen that way. Others, I've had an opening for whatever reason where I've been able to talk to them directly. Mm-hmm. And I've had some ministers apologize, back down, promise me they will not right. say those things. You know, mm-hmm. So I have not ignored it. My answer is, I don't know of someone who is a racist. If I do, we have to discipline them, yeah. just like any other sin. Mm-hmm. If, if a preacher is found in sin, we have to deal with it. Mm-hmm. So if a preacher is found in the sin of racism, we're going to have to talk to the district superintendent. And we're going to have to deal with it. Now, I, I will say there have been some that I felt like they were insensitive mm-hmm. or ignorant. In, in their mind, they didn't think they were racist. But when I looked at it or when other people looked at it, they would say, well, that's racist or at least very inappropriate. And I, as I've just mentioned, I've tried to deal informally with those to get them to uh, see the error of their ways, retract some things or make some corrections or make some apologies or change their ways. Mm-hmm. So that would have to be an ongoing process. Mm-hmm. Uh, my point is it's not something we can ignore. And, and I will elaborate on that. There are some people who are intentional racist. You're probably, it's going to be rare that you would find someone uh, in our ranks that would be like that or that would admit they're being like that. Mm-hmm. I think a bigger problem is people that would, in their mind, they don't think they're racist. Mm-hmm. But because of their lack of knowledge, they will say things that have the same effect. Sure. And so they're hurtful and will be perceived as hateful. And, you know, as far as the recipient, uh, if you're a person of color and somebody says something to you or does something based on your race, whether they intended to be racist Mm -hmm. or whether they just said it out of ignorance, the impact on you is really going to be the same. So as a general superintendent, I'm not just interested in eradicating open racism. I'm also interested in training education Mm -hmm. to eliminate the effects Mm -hmm or the influences, right. or the perceptions, or the uh, inappropriate statements, even if the person says, no, they're not racist. Right. But still, uh, and then, of course, you know, in our culture, there's such a, we're not trying to be politically correct. Mm-hmm. We're trying to be biblically right. correct. So we're not buying into cancel culture that for every thing somebody has said that might hurt somebody's feelings or be misunderstood, that we're just going to go after them. But we are definitely trying to create an environment where we respect one another. And whether it's on social media or from the pulpit or in conversation, we can't talk like the world talks. Um, We might have political opinions and social opinions, and they might be different in the church, and they're going to be. But our conversation has to be different from the world because we're Christians and we love and respect one another. Yes, sir. I, I, and, and with that said, um, I had an experience recently, three weeks back. A, a young lady, she may be in her 30s the most, um, Caucasian, is an African-American lady in a Home Depot store. She was the customer, the young lady was an employee there. But this older African-American lady was so rude to her, was so like, just very disrespectful, just very unkind. And that bothered me. And I spoke up. And I, I, I thought to myself, if the tables were turned, the first thing I would be thinking is that that Caucasian lady is a racist. Mm-hmm. And so I felt like if I would have the same conviction, if, the, if, if, if that young, older lady was Caucasian treating a black person like that, it would offend me. Yes. It offend me equally that an African-American lady would have treated um, an employee like that. And I yeah. spoke up. And I think what we need more is more of those things where it don't matter who he or she is, if you're being rude or you're being unkind or you're being, because uh, I mean, the, all races, we, we can have racism in any race. Yeah. And so I think we need more of that where people are willing to speak up with us on social media, in our churches, when we see something that we know, even if it's someone of our same race or behaving yes. wrong, I think we need to um, speak. Uh, You're right. We, we, we need to speak up for what's right. And I believe on social media, especially, we shouldn't just like something or comment on something or, or maybe even ignore something. Right. We have a responsibility yes, to pull it back to a That's Christian right. conversation. Right. And so we need more of that. 
Um, let me ask you, um, how do we combat dissimulation in our local, district, and national level? Well, when you say uh, dissimulation, you know, that, that's a biblical phrase in Galatians. Uh, it's interesting. The Apostle Peter received a great revelation that the Gentiles could be saved right. without becoming Jews first. And, and by the way, I'll say, you know, these issues aren't new issues. If you look at the book of Acts, they dealt with uh, ethnic prejudice in Acts chapter 6. Yes, uh, it's interesting. The uh, Greek-speaking widows felt they were being discriminated against in favor of the Hebrew speaking or Aramaic speaking. Uh, and so um, the apostles appointed people and had the congregation select people who are spiritually minded, who could take care of these business matters in a fair way. Um, these are perhaps what would be called deacons today. Uh, and interestingly, they picked people with all Greek names, which indicated they looked to spiritually minded people from the minority in order to make sure justice was done. And that's very interesting to me because they were showing their trust in the people that felt they were being mistreated. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you have, of course, Acts 15, uh, where you have Acts 10, where Peter preached to the household of Cornelius. God had to show him it was okay to preach to the Gentiles. And right. I think it's interesting because in Acts 2, Peter preached that the outpouring of the Spirit was for all flesh. But he didn't fully understand that. He thought it meant all Jewish flesh, which shows how unconsciously, even in the church, we can be so influenced by our upbringing and our preconceived ideas, we don't see the fullness of what God's going to do. But God had to give him a vision three times to prove to him that when Joel said all flesh, it didn't mean all Jewish flesh, it meant all flesh, including Gentiles. How interesting. And so in Acts 15, they had a big council in Jerusalem where they made the decision that people of all every ethnicity could come in the church without becoming Jews. But in the middle of that, there was this conflict in, in Galatians that Peter withdrew from fellowship with Gentile Christians under pressure right. from other Jewish people. And that, that's the biblical example. Yes. And so what did Paul do? Paul rebuked him to his face. So Paul went directly to him. So if we feel that someone in the church is discriminated against us or mistreating us or is prejudiced against us, if there is some kind of relationship, I think the best thing is to go directly to that person. So for instance, if you felt that I had intentionally or unintentionally treated you wrong, mm -hmm. the best thing would be to come to me personally and right. say, Brother Bernard, I don't know if you meant this or not, but this is what, what you said and this is how it made me feel. It's good. And if I'm sincere, I'll listen. Right. And if I'm wrong, I'll correct it. And if if it was a misunderstanding, I'll explain. Mm -hmm. Either way, right. we're reconciled. Yes, but that does presuppose some kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. So so Paul and Peter were peers, they, but they respected one another. They worked mm -hmm. together. And so Paul went directly to Peter and rebuked him. Right. And he went to Barnabas, his co-worker, and rebuked him. Mm -hmm. But that's because he had a relationship. Right. He wasn't just attacking. Uh, so if you don't have a relationship, then I would say go through a mediator. So go through someone in authority, such as the president or the district superintendent, or maybe there's a mutual friend or mentor. So so let's say that you didn't even know who I was. Uh, you know, we never really had a conversation, but I said or did something that personally hurt you or, or you felt like you needed to hold me accountable. Well, go to someone who's my mentor or my, my leader or my friend. Right that there's a mutual trust. And that's what Jesus said in Matthew 18, yes. go with someone else. And then if necessary, if you can't resolve it any other way, take it to the church, Jesus said. So there could be a time where you would say, this person hasn't listened, this person hasn't responded, and it's more than just personal feelings. This person is wrong. Right. Well, then you may need to go to a more formal process, take it to the church, which for a minister, I would say go to the district board, and they would appeal to the minister and maybe even have to summons him for a disciplinary matter. But I don't think we just ignore these right. issues. Right. I think, and I should preface it all by saying, first of all, pray. Mm -hmm. Because God may tell you, hold your peace for right now. Or God may tell you, I'm working on something. Mm -hmm. So you always want God's mm -hmm. timing and God's plan. Or God may say, you know, hold your peace for now because... I'll give you the right opportunity. 
I'm not saying to sweep anything under the rug. I'm saying go to God in prayer first, right. then go through the steps that I've outlined. Yes, sir. Thank you um, for those answers. Uh, one question they had, um, due to the current um, racially charged climate, is it possible to create a culture in the United Pentecostal Church International where critical conversation can take place among the ministers in both local, sectional, and the national level? Certainly. I, I think we need to do that. And hopefully what we're doing right now right. is Go helping to towards that. But I think we need to form friendships. And what I tell ministers, because I do find ministers across our fellowship are people of goodwill. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of our preachers, and I'm thinking mostly of our, our white, Caucasian, Anglo preachers, they're not sure exactly what to say to their church. They want to do the right thing, but they're bombarded on both sides by media. And so they don't want to say the wrong thing. Right. So a lot of times they say, you know what? Right. I'm not going to say anything. What I would suggest is if, if you're a pastor, and this could be for anybody, black, white, or whatever, but I'll just take the typical case of a Caucasian pastor. If you have some minority members in your church, just sit down and talk with them. Good. Ask questions. Ask about their life experience. They they are love and appreciate the church or they wouldn't be there. But that doesn't mean that everything is just okay. Mm -hmm. Ask their experience. And here's what I found a very good question. They love you as a pastor. They love what God has done in their life. They've been saved. Mm -hmm. And so, so they will overcome a lot of side issues. Mm -hmm. But ask them, what about your unsaved family and friends? Would they feel comfortable coming to our church? Mm -hmm. And if not, why not? And what could we do as a church? What could we do to adjust whether it's our music, our order of service, the way we greet visitors? Uh, what could we do that would be more welcoming and inclusive? So having those conversations, and if you don't really, uh, another conversation is with fellow ministers right. of a different race. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and ask them much the same questions or even in the community, reaching out to people of other races in the community, uh, just to find out what's going on in our community. What's your perception of the community? What's your perception of our church? Right. What could we do to bring healing to our community instead of uh, you know, it's tension? Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, having those honest conversations and right alongside that, I would say educating yourself, reading some books, and you don't have to agree with everything right. in them. Mm -hmm. But there, there again, I'm so happy about the mosaic curriculum that's going to come out because that's going to be written by UPCI people for UPCI people. And, and it's going to be our own internal uh, presentation. But there's several good books. And uh, in my uh, in the racial and ethnic affirmation that I put online that I mentioned earlier at UPCI.org, I did list some references, uh, both Christian and secular references, uh, kind of a middle road with all that's going on in our culture. How, uh, you know, what about social justice? Obviously, we do believe in justice. That's a right. biblical principle. We believe in holiness. Uh, but we don't believe in Marxist or secular right. uh, approaches that would destroy uh, the family or that would uh, bring socialism. So what's the balance? What What's the right way to talk about these things? What's the right way to deal with these things? So I've I, I listed some books that could be helpful resources. But I think having these conversations, having personally educating ourselves, um, even doing that sometimes maybe in ministerial meetings, mm -hmm. uh, in meetings with young ministers, I, I think, you know, and again, there's a balance because some people saying, well, we don't need to talk about this. You're just going to stir up trouble and you're going to be politically correct and you're going to fall into the world's way of doing things. Uh, but and others would be pressing to do more. Right. And I would say to both sides, wait a minute, the church is the church. No, we're not gonna be politically correct. No, we're not going to have secular radical yes. endeavors. But if the church, the church has to speak for itself. And if the church doesn't speak, we're letting the world inform our young people. And we're letting the world inform our young ministers. So we can't afford to do that. The church needs to say what it thinks. Yes. And it's what we think is going to be based on the word and the spirit. Amen. But I do think we need to have these conversations and God will help us Amen. do so. And my focus is ultimately winning souls. And I realize we're trying to win sinners. We're not trying to win saints that already have a mature, balanced, biblical understanding. Right. We're, we're reaching people that 
are, uh, maybe they have misperceptions, but we've got to overcome those right. in order to win them to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and so regardless of their political position or regardless of how they view us, how can we remove barriers so that we can more be more effective in winning lost souls to Jesus Christ? Yes, sir. Bishop, I'm going to ask you three quick last questions. Okay. And, uh, and then, and again, thank you for the candor um, in your answers. Um, is there anything being done to help grow black leadership in the movement? Yes. Uh, we're trying to be very intentional about this. Of course, my goal is uh, I'm trying to grow leadership among everybody. I'm trying to recruit more ministers. We can't call people to preach, but we can create an environment, an atmosphere where they are exposed to the need and exposed to a, a burden and they can be sensitive and open to the call of God. So my first answer is I'm trying to reach out to all young people of every race mm -hmm. and saying the church needs you, the kingdom needs you. Be sensitive to the call of God, whether it's to preach or do mm -hmm. anything else. But I think having said that, we must be intentional about increasing the pool of potential ministers and potential leaders. And there's nothing wrong with being intentional in finding uh, someone that you can mentor, that you can train, and reaching out beyond your comfort zone. So if we want to increase our diversity in order to, to, to match our society and to win people of our society, then we have to go out of our comfort zone out of the people we know and, and try to reach out and, and be more intentional about bringing people into uh, a pool of ministry and leadership. We're not talking about promoting unqualified people. We're not yeah. talking about promoting people just because of race, but we are talking about expanding our um, sphere of influence and mentorship uh, so that we can be more intentional of people of all races. And yes, I think on district levels, which is where a lot of this work has to be done, uh, we're trying to be more effective in reaching the diversity of our society and including the diversity of our churches. And so one way we can do that is through very, our various district meetings, just to be more inclusive and more intentional of the range of people that already exist in our churches right. and using them and promoting them and thinking about them. When it comes time to vote, for positions or to nominate or to appoint, we, we instead of just thinking about our closest friends or our family members or the people we are comfortable with or people we know about, think of other qualified people that whether they be black, white, or whether they in rural areas, urban areas, uh, think beyond uh, our immediate experience. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's happening organically. It is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are being more intentional about creating more positions uh, where we can use people, uh, new people. It's not only just a matter of race, it's a matter of first generational converts mm -hmm. that we can't just have people who've been in church several generations, only they can be appointed. Right. We've got to reach out to the young adult that might be right. a first generation convert and see how they can be used as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. Two quick questions, and I know our time is... Um join near here. Um, what are some tangible things that can put in place to address the culture? Yeah. Of the well, we did a couple of things in uh, our general conference 2020, two things that were symbolic, but also significant. One is I mentioned the directors of building the bridge and Spanish evangelism and multicultural ministries. These three positions are, are would be typically held by someone who's not white, right. who's black, uh, Hispanic or some other, in the case of multicultural right now, Native American. Yeah. So those became, those positions became voting members of the general board. So automatically, you now have a place at the table where people from different backgrounds are going to be there. They're going to have a vote. They're going to have, be in part of any conversation that we have about any major decision. That brings a different perspective to the table. That's a structural change. Right. Uh, the second thing we did is we made it opening for presbyters at large on the district level, which means any district of it in its own choice, if they feel like there's a significant minority in the district that needs to be represented at the district board, of course, 
that often happens just through the electoral process, as as in your case, you were elected by ministers, the majority of whom I assume were not, uh, they're probably Caucasian, but they elected you, not not because you're black, but because they felt like you were the best one to represent them. And of course, that's, that's great, that should be. Right. Um, but in addition, if there's a significant, say, Hispanic population that speaks Spanish or significant African-American population, then the district can uh, elect a presbyter at large to make sure that perspective is always going to be represented on the district board. That is also a structural change. Now, I, you know, we don't have time to go through a lot, but right. if you go through the timeline that I have on the website, you'll see we had taken many steps over the years, but those are true two significant structural changes. Uh, and then I've already mentioned on the international level, we already have a very interracial fellowship and leadership. And, and that has been intentional over right. the last 10 years. Uh, we've added a, a, a secretary that is elected from outside North America. Mm -hmm. So that way we have someone at the very top level mm -hmm. who's gonna represent somebody that's not American or Canadian. Yes, sir. Bishop Bernard, thank you for your time. One last question, and this question has come up often. I think this question not only comes up in the African-American circles, but in, in some respects in other circles, in particular our younger people, and the question of interracial marriage. Um, how would you address that? Because it, it's, it's, it's a concern of- Yes, of, significant. Yes, sir. yes. Well, let, let's be clear. Um, interracial marriage, of course, you know, uh, we have interracial marriage in my immediate family. Right. Um, but first of all, biblically, there's nothing theologically wrong with interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. The Bible speaks about marrying unbelievers. Ancient Israel was not supposed to marry pagan tribes, mm -hmm. but that had nothing to do with race. That had to do with religion, the worship right. of the one true God. If you study the example of Moses, Moses was persecuted for interracial marriage and God vindicated him. Uh, so uh, it's not a biblical issue. It can be a cultural issue. What I did as a pastor, I tried to give premarital counseling to everyone. And I didn't talk about race. I talked about your family background, your culture, your values, your goals. Are you compatible? Uh, so you have to work through that mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if, if there is an interracial marriage, uh, particularly in America, mm -hmm. Obviously, in some places, that could be more significant than others. Mm -hmm. And so that is not to say um, it's wrong. It's just to say you need to walk in with your eyes open. Right. And you shouldn't be. Now, this may be less true than when I was young. It looked like some people would choose an interracial relationship to make a statement, mm -hmm. to be rebellious or to get back at their family. And that's always a bad <laughs> reason. Mm -hmm. So I tried to ask them, what are you doing and why are you doing it? Make sure you know what you're doing and make sure when you get married, really two families are coming together. Right. So as much as possible, you want your families on the same page. Right. If not, that's just another hurdle that you're gonna have to be intentional mm -hmm. about overcoming. So my advice was always, just make sure you're doing the right thing for the right reason, that you're intentional, that you, you honestly identify any issues that may come up, whether it's race, ethnicity, language, or it could be two white people or two black people, right. but coming from very different right. families, very different cultural right. backgrounds. So it's the same advice I'd give to any couple. Yeah. But having said that, I'm not gonna try to tell you it's God's will for you to marry this person or not. Right. I'm gonna give you the guidance, mm -hmm. but you're gonna have to make the final decision. Right. And if you're both living for God and you both love God and you both affirm that you love each other, you both affirm this is God's will, I'll try to help you work through all the issues at the end of the day, then of course, I'm going to try to help you. I'm going to marry you. Right. And if problems come up, I'm going to try to help you resolve them. Sure. So I feel like we need to move this out of theology and out of spirituality and more into the framework of every marriage. We need good premarital counseling and good decision making and and then leave it up to the couple. So, and, and again, I'm through, but yes, there's people who have asked or say that they've had issues of that with pastors who would not marry a person from a different race. You know, I, I definitely that's happened in the past. I think that's far receding now. Um, and I do think for some in more recent years, it's been a caution. Well, you know, if you're a minister, your ministry could be effective and, and affected. And I think some of those are well-meaning. They're just trying to say, do you realize you might have some trouble with some people? 
But I think we have to be more positive than that. We we have to we have to affirm, you know, it's true of anything. You, some doors might be closed, but God will open other doors. So you can't live in fear and doubt. And I do think we have to create a church culture where we move past these issues. Th these are personal issues that need to be decided personally. It's not something for the church to try to jump in and tell people what to do. Yes, sir. Um, so my feeling is I do believe there have been some that have been hurt in the past, mm -hmm. uh, affected in the past. But I hope that as we're moving more trying to be more biblical, we're going to always be a conservative holiness movement. Mm -hmm. But in our conservative holiness stands, we've got to make sure we're being biblical. Right. Otherwise, we can discredit our yes. stand. And I, so I would just appeal to everyone, let's go back to Scripture yes, sir. and let's go back to being led of the Spirit. Yes, sir. Bishop Bernard, let me, let me say this. Thank you for your time this morning, this afternoon. Um, and thank you for your candor. Um, you know, uh, this has been a great conversation. You have just spoke eloquently and forth, forthrightly and well. And I believe that conversations like this, if we will continue them, um, not just here with you and I, but others yes. in our districts and even in some other places, I think we can make a difference. I believe that the time is right for the church to be on the forefront of these um, issues. And for too long, we have been afraid well, thank you for not being afraid to address these in such a way. And I appreciate yes. your, your time. Well, thank you. I will say on that last question of interracial marriage, as a matter of fact, we have a, a, a number of examples of interracial marriage among our ministers and yes. even among uh, our missionaries, among top leaders. Right. Right. Uh, so that as far as the UPCI is concerned, right. uh, that's not an yes. issue. Yes. But on an individual level, of course, uh, everybody has to try to find the will of God for their life. But I would challenge all of us mm -hmm. to be biblical and be open to people of different backgrounds and perspectives. And I, I hope you've gotten something out of this. Maybe you didn't agree with everything or understand everything. But after all, uh, conversations like these Amen. among Christians, I believe, are going to help us be stronger and better Christians and uh, I, I do believe the United Pentecostal Church International and the Apostolic Movement generally, we are the force for revival in the world today. Amen. We don't want anything to hinder us, but we want to fulfill our mission of the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church. Amen.